Now, the ongoing debate over zero bail policies and the increasing crime across the country has become a hot topic of national significance. At the crossroads of this contentious issues are criminal justice reform advocates who contend that releasing individuals charged with a crime back into society for free pending trial not only promotes fairness, but also results in a decrease in crime rates. On the other side, law enforcement and victims' rights groups alongside the bail industry argue that releasing defendants without any accountability poses a very serious threat to public safety. Now, the polarized debate is capturing the attention of both policymakers and the public with both sides presenting compelling arguments and supporting studies to bolster their claims. We make this debate particularly intriguing in the contention between two sides regarding the interpretation of crime statistics. Now, now while criminal justice reform advocates argue that any increase in crime is a is a uh, uh, particular issue rather than a factual one, their opponents contend that the statistics are facts are inarguable. The former contends that the crime overall is going down across America, citing a big picture view. Meanwhile, supporters of tougher laws are looking at specific jurisdictions where bail reform has been implemented. They contend that violent crime specifically has increased dramatically in these regions. Now, in a recent CNN story, the former Deputy Commissioner of Intelligence and Counterterrorism for the NYPD cited a survey conducted by the National Retail Federation of its members showed that 81% felt that retail crime had grown more violence from the previous year. He also noted that the retail giant Target had closed stores in New York City, Portland, and Los Angeles, and all cities which had implemented some form of bail reform in recent years. So, we are going to have the luxury of talking to this subject of, uh, with a Mr. Ken Good. Now, about Ken W. Good. Ken is a graduate from Hardin Simmons University in 1982 with a bachelor's of arts degree. He received a master's of education degree in 1986 from uh, Tarleton State University, a part of Texas AMM system. In 1989, he received his law degree from a Texas Tech School of Law where he was a member of the Texas Tech Law Review. Mr. Good has argued cases before the Supreme Court of Texas and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, all over numerous court appeals, including the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Mr. Good is married with two daughters. So we are glad to welcome him to this show to talk about this pressing matter of bail reform. And welcome, Ken, to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Welcome. So you heard me reading your your intro, and I'm just trying to see like um, what perspective do you take on this um, issue, and how did you how to become you know important to you? What got me interested in this area of the law was I think part of it's my background. I've always been interested in appellate issues. When I was in law school, I was on several national teams on appellate type legal issues, and I was on a team where a brief was uh, selected as the best brief in the nation. And and so when I entered pri private practice, I started or I continued that interest. I've argued cases at the Supreme Court of Texas, the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, it seems like whatever I've been doing, I've continued my appellate interest. And so I was asked to go to a hearing in the O'Donnell versus Harris County case, which was one, which was the first case uh, that kind of reached national attention in this bail-related uh, criminal justice reform movement. And I attended the hearing, and I was I became very concerned. I thought the judge was off base. I thought she was not applying the law correctly, and uh, I didn't think even the parties were arguing uh, the issues correctly. And so I came out of that hearing. Um, professing concern, and I set about uh, to become knowledgeable on the issues of equal protection and due process and how it applied to bail issues and criminal justice issues. And I've written, since then, I've written numerous articles on this on these issues. And I, I think t history has proven me correct because now uh, Judge Rosenthal, who was the judge of uh, in O'Donnell, has been reversed six, seven, probably eight times on these issues. And the most recent case, which is Days versus Dallas County, went up to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit said both it reversed O'Donnell and ruled that both Daves and O'Donnell should have never been filed in federal court. 
And then yesterday, the uh, United States Supreme Court denied cert on the Dave's case. So that uh, that those two cases that have finally come to an end as of yesterday. Well, that's that's good. How do, how do you think that? Where did you think it went off the the rails as far as even with the judge um, not not presenting the facts correctly? Yeah, well, well intentioned well, I think, or I think I think where they went off was the plaintiffs were arguing that people have a right to release so you can never hold somebody even if they're a gang member a career criminal or a member of organized crime there is no situation that you can hold somebody in jail pre-trial even if they say if you let me out i'm going to run um, they were arguing that there's no situation where you can hold them if they're not charged with an offense set out in the Constitution that allows you to hold them. And I think fundamentally that's wrong. I mean, judges have the ability to say, I mean, the whole purpose of pretrial bail is what assurance are you going to give the court that you're going to return and respond to the charges? And if the court gets the opinion that you're not going to come back, the court has the right to hold you. Um, that's not, I mean, I think they misapplied the law there. And also, uh, I think Judge Rosenthal did great damage to the legal system across the United States because there were other courts that followed her ruling, and I think she was fundamentally wrong. She wrote a dismissal in the um, uh, Russell versus Harris County case, which was a subsequent case which was going to extend O'Donnell, and she was going to do it until she started losing, or the uh, Dave's case started uh, uh, losing on that position, getting reversed. And so she, in October, she wrote a dismissal in the uh, Russell case, and she wrote an impassioned plea for the U.S. Supreme Court to grant cert, which they just denied yesterday. Mm. And I think she was just absolutely wrong. She drank the Kool-Aid and became invested in the plaintiff's position and did not realize the terrible injury she was doing to the criminal justice system. And what 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 is the important role for the the bail system and the industry in the criminal justice system and uh, the secondary question is if if there's been damage done how how can the general public or like lawyers start to claw claw it back to get it moving back in the right okay direction? so what is the importance of the bail industry to the criminal justice system there there was a news nation town hall and if i was going to quote a mayor, a Democratic mayor, uh, I would quote uh, one of the mayors in that uh, town hall. This is what she said. Until you have an alternative to the private industry that has the same low failure to appear rate, so everybody goes to court, and the same high level of accountability, then you don't have an alternative. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's true. The bail industry has the lowest failure to appear rate. I mean, and if you think about the criminal justice system, failure to appear rate means everything. If you have less than a 10% failure to appear rate with one mechanism and then a 40, 50, 60, an 80% failure to appear rate using simple release mechanisms like are being used in California for misdemeanor courts or being used Harris County right now in misdemeanor courts, an 80% failure to appear rate, you can see the backlogs are impacted immediately because criminal cases have to be put on hold if you miss court. They have to be put on hold till you come back. And what people don't realize is the bail industry has an incentive to go find you. So mm -hmm. if I don't show up for court, they have an incentive to go find me. But if we use one of these simple release mechanisms, then no one's going to look for them. They're just issuing a warrant. So they either have to come back willingly or they have to commit another crime to be brought back into the system. Mm -hmm. And that difference creates a huge impact on the criminal justice system. Simple release mechanisms drive up failure to appear rates, gives a green light for people to commit more crime. It creates chaos. Through chaos, you no longer have the ability to hold anybody accountable because there's chaos. And it pushes for de facto decriminalization because at some point the criminal justice system is just going to go crazy and it's going to collapse unless you start dismissing cases. Harris County in August of 2021, they had a report of all the cases in misdemeanor court that they resolved for the month. Over 90% were dismissed. That's what happens when you use these simple release mechanisms. No accountability can be had. Mm. And and the, so when you say the simple release uh, mechanism, is that just where they release somebody on their own recognizance under the honor system that they're going to return? 
Yes, and it depends on where you are in, in the country on what you call it. Like California would be called zero bail. New York would call it release without bail. In Texas, we would call it release on a personal bond, which, you know, it's your personal promise to show up. But they're all the same thing. You're being released on your, like you said, and they're, we're counting on you to come back on your word. And, and that's the problem. You know, the whole um, foundation of that thought was, well, people want to come to court. They want to get their case resolved. We've learned in the last two years that's not yes, true. That's not people don't want to go to court. They don't want to be held accountable. And if you tell them they won't be, they'll take advantage of it by committing more crime. There's a report from Yolo County, California, that during COVID, they, uh, they discovered that if somebody was released on zero bail, simple release mechanism versus a surety bail, surety bond, the person released on simple release had over a 200% greater chance of committing a violent offense in the next 18 months. Wow. That speaks for itself. And so, so the people who believe in the, in the zero bail model or the, the simple release model, what is their objection to the bail industry? Is it that they say if not everybody can afford it or, or what, what arguments do they make? Well, they started out arguing that the current bail system was unconstitutional, so we had to change to something else. Uh, and so that's why they started all this litigation. But now we've had two courts of appeals, and the Supreme Court has denied multiple petitions for cert saying uh, that bail is constitutional. So we've had Sanchez versus Alabama say that uh, bail is constitutional, Calhoun versus uh, Georgia, I think, they said that uh, bail is constitutional, and the Supreme Court denied cert. So then their arguments became, well, this is fundamentally unfair. But then we go back to, hey, until you have an alternative that has the same low failure to appear rate or the same accountability, you don't have an alternative. Mm -hmm. So if you try something else that's going to require you to have double the amount of courts to resolve the same number of cases under the current system of, of private bail, then you don't have an alternative. And that's really the reason why the bail industry has been around for 200 years. Nobody can reach their level of performance. And so now you just have this argument, well, the poor are being taken advantage of. Look, no one is questioning that we have to have alternatives to protect the poor. But once you have a criminal history, you don't you don't have a right to run run free on your own promise once you have a criminal history. And so I think now it's just becoming political. It's becoming, um, a, a, you know, if you're a one extreme of the political spectrum, you have to be against uh, the private industry, no matter the result. I think you could look at what's going on across the country and you would say, those politicians are in a box. Because look at Oakland, California, the NAACP in the last five months, six months, came out with a, a letter attacking their local officials. And they said, we need a state of emergency on crime because crime is so bad right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. And the local officials were like, oh, no, it's so terrible that you're taking the talking points from the other party. And they're like, and, you know, the, the, the uh, regional NAACP came back and said, no, we support the local chapter. Crime is running amok. So I think the, some of these politicians are in a box. They supported it to get elected, and now they cannot reverse course even though they know they need to. Yeah, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head because I think that what people look at is kind of the extreme one-off case where somebody was was put on bail or was incarcerated and they couldn't afford to get out and then that person was innocent and then their life was ruined and they take that as the overarching thing where it, and they try to apply that model. I know personally people who had bench warrants because they didn't appear and they had no intention you know of, of appearing they they left the court and basically went right home and started saying their goodbyes you know and and were, were free for years until they got pulled over you know for, yeah. for, for a traffic violation and then and then the bench warrant shows up and and some, sometimes it was something small where it was like you could have appeared and it was a fine and and another time it was I have a coworker whose um, spouse was abusive. Literally left and told them it basically she was telling them if this person leaves, you know, we I am in danger, you know. And she had to leave her home and has been like running, living in hotels for the past two years, and they're still looking for the guy, 
Well, there's so many examples, especially in Harris County, where we've seen some of these reforms tried by court fiat by the O'Donnell case, which has now been reversed. And the problem with it is, you know, it got to the point when it got to the really bad extreme. You know, before, if you were accused of murder, you got held in jail. But now suddenly you you had, you know, they had courts saying, oh, well, we're going to release you. We have to release you because, you know, we, we had these arguments being made that you can't hold somebody if um, – if the Constitution doesn't allow it. And so until that argument was reversed, you know, we had courts doing that. And so I, it got to the point where I was arguing in Harris County, Texas, in Houston, Texas, you get one free murder before they're going to hold you in, in jail. <laughs> Just like if you were a dog, you get one free bite. Mm. And finally, I think, you know, with SB6 passing and also with uh, re- some of these cases being reversed, you've got some judges who are actually saying, hmm, maybe what I was doing was wrong, and they've gone back to what they've done historically. Yeah. And have, have, do you think they haven't come up with any alternatives because in all reality there's just not any viable solutions? Yet. I mean, until there is an alternative, you know, the, what group was it? The, the Vera Institute came out uh, probably a couple of years ago, and they argued to the judges, oh, any alternative to the private industry is going to have a 40% failure to appear rate, but that should be okay. And and I'm like, well, you just showed that you don't understand uh, the criminal justice system. A 40% failure to appear rate shuts down the criminal justice system. I mean, the bail industry has less than a 10%. I don't care what people say, it has less than a 10% failure to appear rate. If it's higher than that, you're going to go out of business. Mm-hmm. And so until we get something you know what? There are jurisdictions that have gotten close to the bail injury. It's still not as good, but the cost was so high. Uh, uh, you've got Washington, D.C., and you've got the New Jersey model. But the New Jersey plan, they had to do a statewide tax increase, and it still ran out of money. And then I did a podcast with somebody from uh, from Washington, D.C., and they said, straight up, if we had to decide to do what we're doing now, it would never pass because it's so expensive. So the problem is to to meet, you can't ever beat it, but to get close to what the private industry does, you would it would be so expensive that you would never be able to fund it. And part of this reform of the criminal justice system, this bell, is looking for cheaper options. Mm-hmm. And so anything that's going to cost more money, that's why you're looking at the, the, the alternative is simple release. We're just going to take your word because that's as cheap because the private industry didn't cost anything. And so what they don't realize is the failure to appear, stack up, more crime is caused as the result. And so that has a much heavier expense than just holding them in jail until until their case is resolved. So effectively, what does the the bail uh, enforcement officer or the officials do to to make their their model so successful? Well, okay, so I can speak to Texas, and I think others, you know, bail is run by each individual state, but it's, um, but I think other states are are very similar. So in Texas, um, we bond somebody out of jail. So we, the industry is making up its own risk assessment or its own determination of whether this person is someone who should get out of jail. Because, you know, we're promising that if they don't show up at court, we're going to pay 100% of the face amount of the bond. So if it's $100,000 and they don't show up, then we're going to pay $100,000. Mm. So once you once so if I'm set for a hearing and I don't appear, the industry has an incentive. So you need to get them back. You need to get them back quickly. And if you do, you will owe less money. So the reason why the private industry does so well is because they keep track with them. They, they have the highest um, accountability. They have the highest supervision. Uh, they have everything from sometimes they'll have an app that they check in on that tells their GPS location every time they check in. Or if it's a high risk bond, they make them come to the office once or twice a week to check in. So they're always talking to them. I mean, the problem with the government is the government does not, never does anything really, really well. And I think it's very difficult when you're when you can't hire really high uh, value employees to do the job of of the private industry, and so uh, the so the bail industry keeps track of you. And then we, uh, if you don't come to court, we usually have a relationship with you so that you trust us, and so we can talk you into coming back to court, or we know a good general area of where you are, and then we have 
Texas, the bondsmen can arrest so they can locate and then they can either notify law enforcement where you are or we can uh, hire a recovery agent to uh, take you back to uh, jail. And if it's done by a certain deadline, then you pay a lot less than the full amount of the bond. But if it, I mean, it's a strict deadline. And if you don't meet it, you're going to pay uh, 100%. And so that's the biggest incentive for the industry that works. And I think I think on the large scale, the reason why the private industry does such a good job is we involve family members. And everybody says mm-hmm. that's a bad thing. And let me tell you, I don't. I don't think that. Because when, when I have my family, I'm a failure. I've been arrested 10 times. And the charges have gotten worse each time. But I have a family member come in and say, Ken... I'm going to stand up for you and I'm going to help get out of jail because I think you have value and I think you are worth saving. Well, I mean, I mean, I like to say the criminal justice system is some of these people's last chance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Turn around and become productive citizens. And how much more impact does it have when your mom is saying, you're a screw up, but I think you have value. I think you can become productive. Or your brother comes in and does that. Or your sister or your whole family as a group kind of stands up for you. I think I think we are discounting that value. And that is something that the um, public sector can never do. Yeah. And, and uh, the public sector, too, also is because a lot of people, it they, they would be overwhelmed because of the massive caseload. And so it, it, would be, it would become a, just as, as bad as the trust me model. You know, trust me, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Uh, you know, I'll be there. Meanwhile, your cousin's got your phone and they're just texting and you're, you've already fled the country. And, but Well, and, you know, and these are not, I mean, the problem is a lot of these people are people who have not been productive. They, they've, they're screw ups. They've, but, you know, our, our, the criminal justice system, our, our friends on the, you know, our, people who are arguing for reform, they just think, okay, we'll give them a phone and we'll text them when they go to court and that will remind them. I mean, these are nomads. They're going to sell their phone or they're going to thro- break their phone. Mm-hmm. They're not going to keep it for a couple of weeks because they don't want anybody, they're either paranoid, they don't want anybody to know, yeah, or they're, they're going to sell it for drugs or something. And so those things do not work. I mean, it gets you a little bit better appearance rate, but it, it does. it's still far, far afield from what the private industry does. Where do you think that they they can find a bit of the compromise on the issue, or do you think that because the the people that have tried the bail reform model hasn't been working, it's going to eventually work itself out? Well, you know, I'm a big believer in compromise, but I think this is one of those issues that's going to be hard because it's hard to compromise when the other side won't agree with you about what the facts are. I mean, look at this issue about whether crime is going up or whether it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I did a debate with, uh, you know, these attorneys that file these lawsuits across the country and they adamantly say crime is not increasing. I'm like, you know, the uh, NAACP of uh, Oakland says it is. Um, (laughs) You know, property values in San Francisco says it is. And uh, because, you know, the, uh, they're selling commercial buildings for 25%, 50% of their value over two years ago uh, because of crime. The uh, Nancy Pelosi federal bid- building is telling all the federal employees, don't go to work, work from home. It's not safe to park your car and walk from your car to the building. And so that seems like a problem with crime. But what they're doing is they're citing these national statistics that say, oh, crime is going down. But the the vast majority of the country is still using criminal justice theories that we know work. And so they're actually talking out of both sides of their mouths. They're they're getting their little tricks and things being done in these urban areas, which is in absolutely increasing crime. But then they're uh, citing national statistics where the majority of the country uh, follows the tried and tested methods of criminal justice and they're saying see crime isn't going up and everything else is just a perception issue and that's what we hear we heard at the last election it worked probably it will not work again I mean I don't see how you can say crime is not going up when the NAACP in Oakland is saying we need a state of emergency on crime see now I, I can um, see I, I did um, law enforcement security private details blah 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 from 2009 all the way till June of last year is when I finally 
gave it up and um i i know that it was it was going crazy it was part of the reason i left i was i kept seeing it, it get worse and worse and worse so much that when i started working part-time at the 7-eleven you know and this is uh in northwest virginia they lock the doors to the to the coolers now and the, they make the cashiers physically go back <laughs> and, and get the items because they say you know we apologize it's just very high theft you know and and you're you're dependent on somebody well, making... i wonder you know i look i look at california where we've essentially de decriminalized theft under 950 dollars, and i'm like is that one of the reasons why you're saying it's it's crime is going down because we de decriminalized yeah. theft under 950 dollars? i mean if we're going to be honest it's not more public safety it's it's less yes yeah, kinda... you've got businesses closing because they can't withstand all, all the shoplifting. Yeah. That, I mean, I have a big hope because all of that's not sustainable. We cannot uh, function as a society. Uh, and so eventually, uh, I think things will uh, correct itself because what we're currently doing will is not sustainable. Yeah, and I've, I, I lived in D.C. for a little while because I worked for a, a, did a security contract for a Nova Fair Oaks. I was a dispatcher. And I was was shocked when I went to D.C., saw how how pretty it was, and I was going to, I think maybe the store was Safeway, and I just would see people just go and grab stuff and just walk right out of the store, right out of the store mm -hmm. with it. And, and you know, my my daughter was in college, and she wanted to do an internship in D.C., and she applied to be an intern at the White House. And she was accepted, and she was one of three interns in the West Wing daily for a semester. And I was like, well, I'm glad you were accepted, but you can't go because it's Washington, D.C. But <laughs> I had no say. She went, and we went visit visited her. But I'm telling you, I was scared to death over the crime issue. I'm like, I didn't want my daughter, who I love very much, I did not want her to be a story on the 530 News. Mm. Yeah, and it, it, it I, I could see because where I was at was literally I lived on 16th 16th Street in Washington D.C. I was one block from the White House, and mm -hmm. it's just like everything you would see just in that general area from the drugs to the the robberies to the homeless people in tents everywhere cursing on everybody freely, you know, and so. I've seen. I know a lot of that stuff happens in big in uh, big cities, uh, but uh, I don't. I don't think it can be categorized as F has gotten better. I think it's just no, they no. Wait, we're doing a disservice to the public. Yeah, they when just, all these people are living in tents, we're doing a disservice to them. If we would get them into the criminal justice system and use that as leverage to force them to go to rehab for either drug treatment or mental health treatment and get on their drugs. They would be better off than just living out the rest of their life until they overdose mm. and die on the streets, and that's what we're doing. And because we're we're saying we can't force them to go to rehab, but we can offer all these programs. We're going to spend hundreds of million dollars on programs that nobody is take, taking uh, is using. Like in Portland, they've they've you you know they found that zero less than zero point one percent of people are taking advantage of the programs that they're offering that they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on, and so they're they're uh, Solution is to spend even more on these programs. No, let's make what's going on a crime. Let's use that as leverage to force force people to go to rehab because rehab has a seventy five percent failure rate. So they got to go multiple times. Mm. I mean, it, we're we're giving up on these people and we're allowing them to die on the streets. And and that speaks so poorly of us as a society. And and um, I I agree with that. In 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 the, in the whole, because I think a lot of the times, people at least, and this is from the policing side of it. I used to say I used to feel like people try to use police to fix society problems <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that police were not trained to 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 handle, and I'm like that's where everybody else looked away from the problem. You know, they they just wanted yeah. to hide it. You know, and um. I don't really have a solution to fix it. I can just see, like, you know, I always say states are like little models of democracy. So I don't have to guess what works. I get 50 of them to stare at, <laughs> you know. And, well, but we know what works. Yeah, and what yeah. works is, you know, it, it, we teach it in our colleges on criminology. So what's been going on the last few years 
has, is not anything we teach in criminology classes. We're, we've been either innocently trying things that do not work or being led down a primrose path by groups that know it doesn't work, but that's what they want. And so we need to go back to what works. And I think you're going to see the mayors pushing because they're the ones that are being impacted the biggest with drops in tax revenue, and they're not going to be able to provide services. They're going to see buildings that are going to default, and then you're going to see the danger of cities defaulting. And so your mayors, you're already seeing calling for change, and I think that will continue. That's that's how it's going to start with the mayors. Um, and I just want to – what's the opposition to that? I, I thought it was a great – uh, idea with the you you get them in the system you get them into a rehab program you know what what's what's the opposition against that? Well, we don't want to make uh, uh, drugs a crime. Look at Portland; they they uh, decriminalized all heavy drugs, and they said we will get to where you want quicker by decriminalizing drugs, and then you will see the uh, uh, demand for them go down. Well, that, that hadn't happened. I mean, yeah. Portland is an, an open opium den, and people, you know, record numbers of people are, are ODing every month. And so what they claimed would happen uh, did not. And what you're seeing now with, with all these failed theories, they come back and say, oh, we just need more time. We just haven't had enough time. Well, you know, how long do we have to wait? How many people have to die before you're ever going to acknowledge that it's not working. And I think I've come to the conclusion they'll never acknowledge that. That's the reason why we can't compromise with them, because they are not willing to admit what the facts are. They will always argue about the facts. And so until they will, uh, when they realize that this is all just political rhetoric by their side, they have an agenda, we can't. We just got to vote them out. So in Portland, if I'm not mistaken, that's the state that recently uh, decriminalized opioids, magic, All heavy mush drugs. magic mushrooms, mm -hmm. you know, everything. And that was that last year they did that? I think it was a couple of years ago now. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's, it's been devastating to them. I mean, they, they've had people start calling for reintroducing mm -hmm. um, crimes for drugs. And... I mean, they're going to do it by half measure. It's going to continue to fit. Yeah, they they're going to slow walk it. So you have you have your uh, your your magic wand. Uh, you, you're in charge. You get to be emperor for a week. Uh, how do how do we fix the, this situation? Uh, we fix it by. I mean, people are going to say this is self-serving, but I think we fix it by doubling down our reliance on the bail industry because that's how we get people to court. Look at Illinois, you know, their crime started going up years ago when they got rid of the private bail industry. And more recently, they just got rid of cash bonds. That's not the private industry. They were requiring people to post cash. And the problem is they were relying upon that money for court operations on, and to some percentage. Mm -hmm. And so you got, they were relying upon people's failures to appear to run the courts. And so they couldn't hold anybody accountable because they needed that money. Mm -hmm. And so we need to figure out that all those things do not work. We've got to hold people accountable when they don't show up, hold the bail industry accountable when they don't do their job, and then get people through the system. I mean, like in Texas, we have a 20 percent of the prison population is down 20 percent because during COVID, they released a lot of people and cases haven't been through the system. So we've got a huge backlog of people in the county jail system because the cases have not been tried. And we've got to get that those cases through the system and send them to the state prison and we've got to figure out, well, look, if we don't hold misdemeanor people accountable, that's the training ground for tomorrow's felony people. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to just detain a release, all only the bad people, then the jails are full of really bad people because we're not letting anybody out, even the people that will follow the rules. And we have no space to hold anybody accountable for, for low-level crimes, and they'll just run amok. And we've seen that uh, gangs, career criminals, and um, – uh, organized crime, figure out ways to make millions and millions of dollars every day off of that. Yeah, I, I agree. I've, I mean, I, I've seen it as a, a, a slippery slope thing just because I, I work for a, a private uh, owner of several um, gas stations in, in, mm -hmm. this, in this area. 7-Elevens uh, are on every corner. 
and I've I've see you know how much inventory they lose when we get the audit every month. You know, sure. You're talking about forty, thirty thousand dollars monthly, and so you just sit around wondering like how how is that fair to that guy who that's coming out yeah. of his pocket? He's he's got to pay the distributor no matter what, <laughs> you know. And uh, that's right. I've that's seen, right. I've seen people come stand right in line, eat the food, uh, drink the drinks, come right to the register. Uh, I, I don't have any money for it, and you you know, and then they and then people look at you like, "Were you gonna really call the police because he ate ten dollars worth of food?" And it's like, well, "What am I supposed to do?" <laughs> you know, you know. Well, uh, if it's the twelfth time they've done it, yeah. what what are you supposed to do then? Yeah, so. I think it's one of those things where people think it's small because they're not the one having to foot the bill. Yeah. Well, if the choice is between that or closing down the business, what does the public want? Does the public want your business closed down and they can they have to go somewhere else? They want the convenience of going to your business, and that's if if people would like to have more information uh, on, on these issues, they can go to our website, uh, the pbtx.com, which is the Professional Bondsman of Texas, and. Uh, you can um, uh, you could also view our blog, which there's a link on the menu, and you can also visit our we- uh, our uh, podcast, which is called thebellpost.com. Uh, there's a link on the menu, or you can just go to thebellpost.com, and we talk about criminal justice issues, mostly from educating uh, legislators and the public. And so, if you want to know what the New Jersey plan is, we have a podcast on that. If you want to know what happened in the case of Dave's versus Dallas County, we have a podcast on that. If you want to know what happened uh, on uh, uh, what's going on in other states like Hawaii on bail, we have a podcast on that as well. And so those are things that you can do to keep up with cr- criminal justice issues, and we release two podcasts a month. Oh, nice. All right. And how long have you been doing that uh, podcast? Uh, we are fixing to start season three this week. Oh, nice, nice. So I'm going to link to all of that stuff in the sh- in the show notes. And so you guys can have uh, some, some studying to do if you have some questions. And I do like what uh, Ken said uh, earlier, where it's, you, it's not just listening to the arguments. It's going back to, to the facts and looking at the facts of where people have tried what thing and what has worked. And we have to at least go back to the tried and true methods we know work until we come up with a healthy alternative. Uh, thank you so much for for joining the show today, Ken. Oh, well, thank you for having me.